Hey guys, welcome back to our short series on the Book of Enoch. Now, for those of you who don't know what this series is all about, I encourage you to just quickly watch the first video in this series where I do an introduction on the Book of Enoch, the history of the Book of Enoch. You know, you probably recognize it's not a book that's in your Bible. And so we talk about the history of this book and the fact that it's quoted by Jude. And in that video, what I, what I explained was that Jude quotes this book and calls it prophecy. And I also pointed out how Jesus references this book and Jesus calls it scripture. And so this is all something that's really important for us to, to understand that this book was something that was highly influential in the early church, highly influential on the apostles and Jesus and Jude both essentially called it scripture. And so the fact that we still have this book available for us today means that if they're calling it scripture, we really ought to be reading it. And we shouldn't hold on to our traditions that tell us only these books in the Bible are scripture because those are man-made traditions. Those are man-made ideas that we're holding on to and we're holding it as absolute truth and absolute fact when maybe that concept is not actually biblical. And we're going to come back to that at the end of the series. And we're going to look at what does this mean for the canon of scripture and, and the ideas about what books should be in the Bible and what books should not. But in this video, what I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at how influential the book of Enoch was on the New Testament. Because yes, Jude directly quoted it as a direct quotation and Jesus referenced it and both of them called it scripture. But... This was not just something that was quoted by Jude in one place and slightly referenced by Jesus in another. No, the book of Enoch was referenced all throughout the New Testament. It's just that Christians don't know that because they don't know the book of Enoch. I remember growing up in the Protestant church, I was always taught that we decided which book should be in the Bible based off of which books the apostles quoted. That's what everybody always teaches. The apostles quoted these books, so these books were included in the Bible, and they did not quote these other books, so those books were not included. Well, first of all, as we saw in the first video, Jude directly quoted the book of Enoch, directly quoted it, and said it was a quote. So that goes out the window right away. But what I'm going to show in this video, and this is something scholars have already recognized. They teach this. They agree with this. They all recognize that the book of Enoch was highly influential on the New Testament and highly referenced throughout the New Testament. And I'm going to go through the book of Enoch in chronological order through the book of Enoch and just find different references and then compare them to the New Testament so you can see the parallels of what Enoch says versus what the New Testament says. And you can see... They, the writers of the New Testament clearly were drawing from this book. This is a book. The book of Enoch is, again, I'm going to just keep highlighting this. The book of Enoch is definitely, historically, archaeologically, it is definitely a book that predates Jesus and the apostles. It was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It absolutely predates them. That means if they are saying something that is almost a direct parallel as the book of Enoch, they're drawing from that. The book of Enoch isn't drawing from them. They're drawing from the book of Enoch. And we're going to look at at least a dozen or so places where they did this. And this is far from exhaustive. These are just a few that I have grabbed out as I've prepared this video. Now, I will add that some of these passages are more compelling than others. Some of them are not very compelling in and of themselves, but it's the cumulative effect that I want to show. When you've got so many things that are seeming to draw from, or sometimes, quite frankly, they're almost direct quotes themselves. 
when they're drawing from the book of Enoch that much, you begin to understand how important this book was to Jesus and the apostles. And the fact that Jesus is the son of God and he's referencing this book and teaching from this book. And the apostles were taught by Jesus. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. They are, they're writing words that are inspired by the Holy Spirit and they're drawing from the book of Enoch. It gives credibility to the book of Enoch. And it makes it something that we should pay more attention to. And so, yes, some of these you might be like, well, that's not very good, but I'm not really looking at any one individual thing. I'm looking at the cumulative effect of the whole thing, the cumulative references to the book of Enoch and showing this is something they referenced. This is something they taught from. This is something they were alluding to in their letters. And if that's the case, if that's something that Jesus and the apostles were teaching from, then it's something that we should at least be reading. That's my point. And as I said in the first video, I'm not looking to convince you. I am looking to present you with arguments and I'm asking you to be a Berean who hears me out, even if you disagree with me, and then just go look into these things for yourselves. Again, as I said in the first video, condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. If you're going to reject an idea you don't agree with without even hearing it out, that's the height of ignorance. You don't even know what you're talking about and you're rejecting it. And as Jesus said to the Pharisees, you reject the word of God for the sake of your own traditions. The canon of scripture that we have is a human tradition. There is nothing in the Bible that tells us which books belong in the Bible. So it is just a human tradition that these books are the ones that belong in the Bible. And we need to be willing to evaluate arguments put forward to say that there is something else that should be in there. So that's all I'm asking. Hear me out, hear my arguments, and then go look into it yourself. That's all I'm asking. Okay, so to start, we're going to look at 1st Enoch chapter 1, because I'm just going to start at the beginning of Enoch and work my way through and show you the parallels. So to start, we're going to look at 1st Enoch, very beginning, first couple of verses. The words of the blessing of Enoch with which he blessed the elect and righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation when all the wicked and godless are to be removed. And he took up his parable and spoke. Enoch, a righteous man whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angels showed me. And from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw, but not for this generation but for a remote one, which is to come. Okay, so this is very, very opening words of the book of Enoch. And he's basically saying, you know, this is the blessing of Enoch. These are the words that Enoch wrote. He wrote it for those who are living in the day of tribulation, when all the wicked and godless are to be removed. And he said, I saw that I was not writing for this generation. In other words, he wasn't writing for the generation that lived at his time, but he saw that he was writing for a future generation, a distant generation that was to come. Well, similarly, Peter wrote in 1 Peter, this salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's sufferings and his great glory afterward, they were told that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. So again, this is something that if you were to just read the scriptures that we have in the Protestant Bible, at least, you would wonder, where is Peter getting this from? This idea that the prophets we're wondering what time are we talking about? And they were shown that it was for us, for this later generation that was coming. We don't have that story recorded. So either Peter just knew that somehow, or he read the book of Enoch, which told him Enoch was told that this message he had was for a coming generation that was going to live in the last days. So there's a, there's a parallel there between what Enoch said and what Peter said. Definitive? No, maybe not. But there's definitely a parallel. And when we, again, when we look at the full picture of all the parallels, it becomes pretty clear 
that the book of Enoch was being referenced by the apostles. So again, each individual thing I'm going to point out is just one puzzle piece, but it's the cumulative effect that you can then see and recognize they had to have been referencing this book. Here's another example. Now this next one I want to look at is actually, it's really kind of following the story that Enoch is telling us all about. Now, Enoch is telling us the story of these angels that fell. They came and they, they had children with human women. These, these children grew up to be giants. It's really fascinating to read. And there's actually a lot of parallels there that I think are just, if you, if you compare it to even other cultures, other cultures have the same stories that are in the book of Enoch, like in their history. Okay, um, just for an example, the book of Enoch describes God's judgment on these angels that fell and had children who were giants, okay? His judgment on them was, you are going to have to watch while your children, the giants, all get killed in war. There's going to be a giant cataclysmic war that's going to, it's going to cause a lot of destruction, but all of your children are going to die and you're going to have to watch it happen. That's, that's part of your judgment on you for this horrible thing you did. And if you read through this, ew, it was horrible. I mean, this is, these giants were destroying the earth and eating humans and just horrible, horrible things were going on back in that time. But anyway, God tells them there's going to be this cataclysmic war and all of your children are going to die. Well, the interesting thing is Greek mythology tells the same story. It's called the Clash of the Titans. In Greek mythology, the gods came down from heaven, had other children. They were giants on the earth and there was a cataclysmic war in which they were all killed. It's the Clash of the Titans. And now we tend to read Greek mythology and say, oh, they were just writing a bunch of fiction. They were really into fiction. No, actually, they were telling the stories of their gods. Okay, they worshipped these watchers who came down. These, these angels that came down, these are the gods of other religions. This is where those stories come from. Okay, we need to stop treating it like all these other religions are worshipping just simply made up things. Maybe some of them are, but... But a lot of, especially the ancient religions, they were worshiping the actual spiritual beings who came and instructed their societies and taught them the secrets of heaven that people were never supposed to know. These were historical events that happened and those other nations began worshiping those beings and, and wanting that knowledge, again, Man fell because of the tree of knowledge. These people wanted the knowledge that these angels were providing rather than the things that God wants us to have. And so it's just fascinating to me to compare the book of Enoch to other cultures and their stories. Now, yes, their cultures and their stories, I'm not saying they're biblical. I'm not saying they're scripture. I'm not saying that they're even 100% accurate. I'm just saying there are a lot of parallels there, kind of like how a lot of other cultures have a flood story. I mean historians and archaeologists and scientists of the secular world will all deny that the flood ever happened, and yet every culture has a flood story. This is, again, why I don't really give a whole lot of credence to scholars. Okay, every culture has a flood story, and almost every culture has a story that parallels the Book of Enoch, and so that's just one of those interesting things to me. However, I don't have time to read through everything that Enoch says about this story, but the basic gist of it is these angels were in heaven. They fell. They had children with women. Those children were giants. God punished them, said, you left. I, I made you spiritual beings in heaven. You, that's where you were supposed to be. And you left your place. You came down. You did this horrible thing. You caused all this destruction. Now you're going to be locked in places of gloomy darkness. Okay, and I want to read just a few examples from the book of Enoch and then show you how the New Testament is clearly referencing this story. Let's jump in at chapter 10, verse 4. Okay, just for your reference, Raphael is one of the good angels, Azazel is one of the bad angels, and he is actually potentially Satan himself. It's, I'm not totally clear on that, but he, at one point, it said, all sin shall be ascribed to Azazel. So, he was a big wig who caused a lot of problems. But anyway, chapter 10, verse 4. Again, the Lord said to Raphael, 
bind Azazel hand and foot and cast him into the darkness and make an opening in the desert, which is in Dudael, and cast him therein and place upon him rough and jagged rocks and cover him with darkness and let him abide there forever and cover his face that he may not see light. And on the day of the great judgment, he will be cast into the fire. Similarly, if we jump down to verse 11, he's talking to Michael and he's talking about Samhaza, who is one of these fallen angels. And the Lord said unto Michael, Go, bind Samhaza and his associates who have united themselves with women so as to have defiled themselves with them in all their uncleanness. And when their sons have slain one another and they have seen the destruction of their beloved ones, this is what I was mentioning, the clash of the titans, when they've seen this, bind them fast for 70 generations in the valleys of the earth until the day of their judgment and of their great consummation, until the judgment that is forever and ever is consummated. In those days, they will be led off to the abyss of fire and to the torment and the prison in which they will be confined forever. And whosoever will be condemned and destroyed will from then on be bound together with them to the end of all generations. And then finally, uh, in Enoch chapter 12, verse 4, God says, Enoch, you scribe of righteousness, go, declare to the watchers of the heaven who have left the high heaven, the holy eternal place, and have defiled themselves with women and have done as the children of earth do and have taken unto themselves wives. You have wrought great destruction on the earth, and you will have no peace nor forgiveness of sin. And inasmuch as they delight themselves in their children, the murder of their beloved ones will they see. And over the destruction of their children will they lament and will make supplication unto eternity. But mercy and peace will you not attain. So once again, that's what I'm saying. The Greek mythology has the story of the clash of the Titans. And this is multiple times referenced in the book of Enoch. The, these fallen angels have these children who are giants and the fallen angels punishment is that they're going to watch all of their children get wiped out in a cataclysmic war. So I find that interesting. But my point for this video is notice some of the phrasing here. Okay, so Azazel is going to be bound hand and foot, cast into darkness. He says, place upon him rough and jagged rocks and cover him with darkness. Let him abide there forever and cover his face that he may not see light. Okay, well, what does Jude say? Jude says, when warning Christians about falling away, he says, remember the angels who did not keep their own domain, but left their proper dwelling place. The Lord has kept these angels in darkness, bound with everlasting chains to be judged on the great day. So look at what Enoch says. Look at what Jude says. Okay, Enoch is describing the punishment of these angels. What does he say the angels did? He says, Enoch, you scribe of righteousness, go declare to the watchers of the heaven who have left the high heaven, the holy eternal place, and have defiled themselves with women and have done as the children of earth do. Okay, and Jude says, Remember the angels who did not keep their own domain, but left their proper dwelling place. So Enoch says, they were in heaven, they should have stayed in heaven, they left heaven. Jude says, they left their proper dwelling place. Enoch also says, they will be bound hand and foot, cast into the darkness, placed upon them rough and jagged rocks, cover them with darkness, let them abide there forever, and cover their face that they may not see light, and on the day of the great judgment they will be cast into the fire. Jude says, the Lord has kept these angels in darkness, bound with everlasting chains, to be judged on the great day. Similarly, Peter said, when angels sinned, God did not let them go free without punishment. He sent them to Tartarus and put them in caves of darkness where they are being held for judgment. And Peter said this, warning us about false teachers. And he said about the false teachers, a place in the blackest darkness has been kept for them. Well, the book of Enoch describes that blackest darkness, describes this place where these angels are being held, and it says, and whosoever will be condemned and destroyed will from then on be bound together with them to the end of all generations. Peter and Jude are 
talking about this story that does not exist in our Old Testament. They're explaining this story as if you're supposed to already know this story. The angels left their proper place. They came down. They did what was wrong. They defiled themselves with women. And God has bound them in darkness with chains waiting for judgment day. Where are they getting this from? Well, it's the story of the book of Enoch. That's where they're getting this from. That's why Jude goes on to directly quote the book of Enoch. He expects you to know this story. Similarly, in Enoch chapter 18, he's describing this place where he sees these stars who are bound. Okay, stars in the Bible, in the book of Enoch, were angels. And he says he sees these stars bound. And he says, the stars which roll over the fire are they which have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in the beginning of their rising, because they did not come out at their appointed times. And he was angry with them and bound them until the time when their guilt should be consummated, even for 10,000 years. He specifically says there are seven stars there. Okay, well, Jude has been referencing this story in the book of Enoch all throughout his letter. And he also, just like Peter, he's warning about false teachers. And Jude says about the false teachers, they are like stars that wander in the sky. A place in the blackest darkness has been kept for them forever. Okay, well, if you understand ancient culture and how they talked about things, you'd understand that the stars that wander or wandering stars is a way that they described what we call planets. Okay, and I'm not talking about Earth. We're on Earth. I'm talking about the stars in the sky that you see wandering because they don't follow the same course that all the other stars are following. All the other stars are following a specific course through the sky, but the planets or the wandering stars are the stars that kind of do their own thing. They were called wandering stars. That's what Jude is referring to. And Enoch says there is a place where these stars are going to be bound for 10,000 years because they didn't follow the course through the sky that they were supposed to follow. These were the wandering stars. And he says there are seven of them. Okay, well, let's look at what we call the planets. Okay, we're on Earth. We're not talking about Earth. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. So Enoch says there are seven stars that did not follow their proper course. Jude refers to these same things, calling them wandering stars. That's what they called planets back then. What I find really interesting is the fact that Enoch says there's seven of them. Because according to everything we've been taught about science, Uranus and Neptune were not even discovered until fairly recently. But Enoch mentioned seven thousands of years ago. Hmm. Maybe he knew what he was talking about. But my point for right now is just to simply point out the fact that Jude and Peter specifically are talking about this story throughout their letters that they expect us to know about. The angels fell. They came and they joined themselves to women. They had children. They left their proper place. They're now bound in darkness with chains waiting for judgment. The wandering stars are also going to be bound. These are things that Jude and Peter are referencing and teaching from that are not found in our traditional Bibles. But those exact things are in the book of Enoch. It's what the story of the book of Enoch is all about. So Jude and Peter are clearly teaching from the book of Enoch. And Jude directly quotes the book of Enoch just to make sure we have total clarity where he's getting his sources from. So that's really interesting. So now let's look at the next one. In first Enoch chapter nine, there are these angels who are in heaven, they're praising God. And in the midst of their praise, this is this goes on for a number of verses, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but in the midst of it, they say, you have made all things and have power over all things and all things are naked and open in your sight and you see all things and nothing can hide itself from you. So let's compare what Enoch said to what Hebrews then said. And remember, Enoch was written first. So if there's a parallel, Hebrews is probably referencing Enoch. Okay. Hebrews says, 
Nothing in all creation can be hidden from God. Everything is naked and lies open before him, and to him we must give an account. So what the writer of Hebrews is saying is a very similar phrase to what Enoch said. And especially when you take into account the fact that we're working with man's translations. I mean, you could look at different English translations of the book of Hebrews and you're going to get slightly different phrasing. So the fact that we're working with man's translations compounds the fact that this is probably a direct reference to Enoch. In the original languages, these were probably very similar. And that's, it's just worth taking note of. Let's look at the next example. And the next example, to understand the context, Enoch is being shown all these different things, just the secrets of creation, the secrets of the world and heaven and hell and, and all these things. Okay, I'm not going to dive into everything he says, but that's the context. He's just being shown stuff that is referenced then throughout the rest of scripture, you know, heaven and hell and Sheol and all these different ideas. Enoch is shown these things with his own eyes. That's the context. So Enoch says, and beyond these mountains is a region at the end of the great earth. There the heavens were completed, and I saw a deep abyss with columns of heavenly fire. And among them I saw columns of fire fall, which were beyond measure alike towards the height and towards the depth. And beyond that abyss I saw a place which had no firmament of the heaven above and no firmly founded earth beneath it. There was no water upon it and no birds, but it was a waste and a horrible place. He then goes on to explain that this place he is seeing is a prison for some angels who disobeyed. I'm not going to be able to read the whole thing because it's long, but my point is he sees this deep abyss. And on the other side of the abyss is this wasteland where these angels are imprisoned. Okay, well, let's look at what Jesus said. Jesus said, There was a rich man who always dressed in the finest clothes and lived in luxury every day. And a very poor man named Lazarus, whose body was covered with sores, was laid at the rich man's gate. Now it happened that Lazarus died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man died too and was buried. In Hades, he was in torment. Lifting up his eyes, the rich man saw Abraham far away with Lazarus at his side. He called, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. But Abraham said, There is a great chasm set in place between you and us, so no one can cross over to you, and no one can leave there and come here to us. And he continues on with that parable. But the point being, Jesus is describing what it's going to be like for people after they die. And he says the same thing Enoch said. Enoch says, I saw where the ends of the earth ended and there was a great abyss, a great chasm. And on the far side of that chasm, there was a terrible, desolate wasteland with no birds, no sky. It was a horrible place. And that's where the angels are held. Now, the Bible describes hell as a place that was prepared for the devil and his angels. So Enoch is saying there is this place on the other side of a giant abyss. And that's where they are held. And Jesus is saying in his parable that the rich man who ends up in hell is on the other side of a giant abyss, so much so that no one can cross from one side to the other. It's impossible. Jesus' description is the exact same thing as Enoch's description. So that's interesting. That means Enoch is describing spiritual things in the exact same way Jesus describes them. And Enoch described it first. So that lends evidence to the fact that the book of Enoch must be truthful. It must be accurate because he's describing something that no man has ever seen, and yet he describes it the same way that Jesus described it. Interesting. Let's look at more examples. This next example is similar. Enoch describes something that no man has seen, and he describes it the same way the New Testament does. In 1 Enoch chapter 40, he says, starting in verse 1, 
And after that, I saw thousands of thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. I saw a multitude beyond number and reckoning who stood before the Lord of Spirits. And on the four sides of the Lord of Spirits, I saw four presences, different from those that sleep not. And I learned their names, for the angel that went with me made known to me their names and showed me all the hidden things. And I heard the voices of those four presences as they uttered praises before the Lord of glory. The first voice blesses the Lord of spirits forever and ever. The second voice I heard blessing the elect one and the elect ones who hang upon the Lord of spirits. And the third voice I heard pray and intercede for those who dwell on the earth and supplicate in the name of the Lord of Spirits. And I heard the fourth voice fending off the devils and forbidding them to come before the Lord of Spirit to accuse them who dwell on the earth. After that, I asked the angel of peace who went with me, who showed me everything that is hidden, who are these four presences which I have seen and whose words I have heard and written down? And he said to me, this first one is Michael, the merciful and long-suffering. And the second, who is set over all the diseases and all the wounds of the children of men, is Raphael. And the third, who is set over all the powers, is Gabriel. And the fourth, who is set over the repentance unto hope of those who inherit eternal life, is named Phanuel. And these are the four angels of the Lord of Spirits and the four voices I heard in those days. Now, Enoch comes back to these four presences numerous times throughout his story. He keeps coming back to them. But I just want to point out that this is very, very similar to what John saw in the book of Revelation. Now, I'm going to skip through Revelation a bit just for brevity, but starting in chapter 4, John is in heaven. He's seeing the throne of God, and he says, In the center and around the throne were four living creatures, full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was a flying eagle. Each of these four living creatures had six wings and was full of eyes inside and out. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He was, he is, and he is coming. These living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to the one who sits on the throne who lives forever and ever. Skipping ahead to chapter 5. Then I saw a lamb standing in the center of the throne and in the middle of the four living creatures and the elders. When he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell before the lamb and they all sang a new song to the lamb. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you ransom people for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You made them to be a kingdom of priests for our God and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voices of many angels around the throne and the four living creatures and the elders. There were myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands of angels saying in a loud voice, the lamb who was slain is worthy to receive power, wealth, wisdom, and strength, honor, glory, and praise. Then I heard all creatures in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea saying to the one who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshiped. And then in the next chapter, in chapter six, the lamb begins to open the scroll and every time he breaks a seal for the first four seals, one of those four living creatures says come and something happens. Okay. Here's the thing. When we look at this passage, we see so many similarities between what Enoch said and what John said. Okay, Enoch started off saying, I saw thousands of thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. I saw a multitude beyond number and reckoning who stood before the Lord of Spirits. And similarly, John said there were myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands of angels standing before the throne praising God. Enoch says, I saw four presences. John says, I saw four living creatures. Enoch even names them and talks about what their roles are in heaven. Enoch says, I heard the voices of those four presences as they uttered praises before the Lord of glory. The first voice blesses the Lord of spirits forever and ever. And the second voice I heard blessing the elect one and the elect ones who hang upon the Lord of spirits. So, Enoch is describing these four living creatures and they are praising God and they are praising the elect one. Now we're going to come back in 
a future video where we talk about how much Enoch talks about Jesus, and he's referred to in the book of Enoch as the elect one. So Enoch is saying these four creatures, these four presences in heaven are praising God and praising Jesus, praising the elect one, the chosen one, the anointed one, the Christ. That's who they're praising, God and the elect one. John says, the four living creatures are praising God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He was, he is, and he is coming. And then in chapter 5, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell before the Lamb. Each one of them had a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's holy people, and they sang a new song to the Lamb. And then he again describes the four living creatures and the myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands saying in a loud voice, the lamb who was slain is worthy to receive power, wealth, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and praise. And then again, John says, I heard all creatures in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea saying to the one who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and praise and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. So you can see the parallels here. Enoch is saying he saw a vision of heaven and in heaven there are thousands of thousands and tens of thousands times tens of thousands in heaven praising God. With them are four presences. He names those presences and he says they're praising God and praising his elect one. Okay, that is what Enoch claims to have seen in heaven. Now, Enoch is seeing something that no man has seen, or few men have seen. So again, we when we read Revelation, we read Revelation and we accept this one as scripture. And in this one, John is seeing heaven and he describes it the same way Enoch described it. And again, Enoch was written first. So if Enoch is describing something that no man has seen and he's describing it the same way that John describes it when John sees it and John is scripture, then we need to accept that the book of Enoch is accurate. The book of Enoch accurately describes what is happening in heaven, which is something that could not have happened. He could, this book could not have accurately described what's going on in heaven unless it's true. And if it's true, then it's truly prophecy and scripture. Enoch's description of heaven is a perfect parallel to John's description of heaven. That means that when we read the book of Enoch, we're reading the actual words of someone who was given a vision from heaven by God and was told to write it down. That's really important. And it's really important to recognize that Enoch is seeing things that no man has seen and it's accurate these are accurate descriptions we can't just brush over that if we accept revelation to be scripture which i thoroughly do then we need to accept enoch as scripture as well because enoch came beforehand and described heaven in the exact same way which means this book was written by someone who actually saw it that's the only way that's possible Let's keep going. In Enoch chapter 51, Enoch is now talking about the coming judgment, okay? And he says, And in those days will the earth also give back that which has been entrusted to it, and Sheol also will give back that which it has received, and hell will give back that which it owes. For in those days the elect one will arise, and he will choose the righteous and holy from among them. For the day has drawn nigh that they should be saved. So here Enoch is describing judgment day, this coming judgment day, and he says, the earth, Sheol, hell, they're all going to give back the dead. That's that's the, the essence of what he's saying here. They're going to give back the dead, and then he goes on to describe the elect one is going to sit on his throne, and this is judgment day. The elect one sits on his throne and judges the dead, and he picks the righteous out from among the dead for himself. Well, again, in the book of Revelation, in chapter 20, we read John's description of when he sees Judgment Day. And we accept this one as scripture. John says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Then books were opened, and another book, which is the Book of Life, was opened. The dead were judged by what they had done, which was written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. 
each person was judged by what he had done. So again, the book of Enoch was written before John wrote Revelation. And the book of Enoch is describing Judgment Day, and it's saying on Judgment Day, all of the dead are going to be given back. Enoch uses the word Sheol. That is simply the Hebrew word for what we have in the Greek New Testament for Hades. It's the same concept. It's the grave, essentially. All the dead are given back on Judgment Day, and the righteous are chosen out from among them, and they are the ones who are saved. That's the description that Enoch gives. That's the description that John gives. We accept John's account as being true scripture in that he actually saw this take place. And yet the guy who wrote about the exact same event before John, and he described it in the exact same way, and it's an event that still has not yet occurred, we don't consider him to be scripture. It's prophesying the future. We say John is accurately describing the future, and yet Enoch is a fraud. But he describes the same thing, and he wrote it before John. That doesn't make sense. Now, there's something else in that passage in Revelation where John is describing something that Enoch also described. John said, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Then books were opened, and another book, which is the book of life, was opened. The dead were judged by what they had done, which was written in the books. So John's saying there are these books in heaven, and there's this one book, it's called the book of life. And the dead are judged by what is written in the books, because everything that they did is written in these books. Well, in the book of Enoch, in chapter 81, Enoch is still, he's having all these visions and he's, he's in heaven. And, he, and in this vision, Enoch is being shown all these things that are going to come. He's being shown like all these future events. And he's handed these books. And this angel tells him in chapter 81, we'll start verse one. This angel hands him these books and he said unto me, Observe, Enoch, these heavenly tablets, and read what is written thereon, and mark every individual fact. And I observed the heavenly tablets, and read everything which was written thereon, and understood everything, and read the book of all the deeds of mankind, and of all the children of flesh that will be upon the earth to the remotest generations. So, again, we've got Enoch is saying there are these books in heaven that describe everything that every person will ever do and i saw them this is back before the flood i mean this is a long time ago enoch reads these books that describe the the actions of all mankind all the way to the remotest generation in other words the furthest generation away from him the generation that lives at the very end these books describe everything that everyone does and these books are in heaven Enoch read them thousands of years ago. And that's all in the book of Enoch. These books exist in heaven. And he references these books a few times throughout his, his writings where he calls them just the heavenly tablets that he read. These books that describe all the actions of mankind through to the end times. Enoch was allowed to read that. And John, in the book of Revelation, which we accept as this is a true vision John had. This is true scripture. We all accept that this actually happened. He actually saw this. He's not pulling from the book of Enoch. We accept this is scripture. And I affirm that. This is scripture. John saw this. And John says, I saw books. And in these books were written all of the actions of mankind. And the people were judged by what was written in the books. History is pre-recorded. Now, I'm not getting into predestination or blah, 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 blah. That's not, it's not something I'm getting into. I'm just saying everything you do, it's been recorded. History has been recorded ahead of time. That's the point. The books describe the actions of mankind and people are judged based on those actions that are recorded. That's what John says. And Enoch says, I read those books thousands of years ago. The book of life was something Enoch was shown back before the flood and it recorded all the actions of mankind all the way up to the to the furthest generation right before the end it described everything everyone's actions are written in these books and that is what is used on judgment day 
So again, we have this thing where Enoch, the book of Enoch is describing what is actually real in heaven that no man has seen other than John. So John saw this thing called the book of life. And this is actually something that, you know, John saw it, but in the book of Philippians, Paul referenced the book of life. He said, everyone whose name is written in the book of life. Well, where did Paul get that idea? Could it be that Paul knew the book of life exists because Enoch described it and Paul is familiar with Enoch's writing? Possibly. So those are just a few examples so far. And I'm actually going to cut this video now because I don't want to get too long. I think it's probably already too long. So I'm going to cut this video now and I'm going to pick this up again in the next video where we're going to keep going through these examples from the book of Enoch and how they have parallels to the New Testament. And then from there after that, we'll move on and we're going to talk about how the book of Enoch prophesied Jesus extremely accurately and how a lot of the descriptions of Jesus in the New Testament only make sense if you understand the book of Enoch. And so we're going to look at that. But for now, I'm going to end this video. Thank you for watching. I hope that this has been very interesting to you because I find this all really interesting to me. I really love the book of Enoch. It is extremely beneficial to read. And there are so many things in it that help me understand the New Testament because I start to understand what they were building from. They were using this book as one of their building foundations and they were building on top of it and they were referencing it and they were expecting you to know the reference, which is why they didn't really elaborate a lot of the time. So really useful. Um, I, I hope that you, you watch this and you think about it and you don't just take my word for it, but you go look into these things yourselves. So I'm going to pick this up in the next video. We're going to keep going through the New Testament and comparing it to the book of Enoch, but I want to just keep this video short because I know I tend to make really long videos <laughs> and I probably already have. So, all right, I will see you in the next video.